Welcome to our channel, Gender as the Core of Power Relations. It is my pleasure to introduce Petu Tashyapa. She was born in 1990 in Kayseri. She was brought up in Kayseri until the age of seven. When she was six years old, she started school in Turkey, and at the age of 11, she moved to America, and she went to East Pyramid Kid High School. When she moved back to Turkey, she completed her last year at Atatürk Anatolian High School in Kripkale. In 2008, she entered Atatürk University. Her department is English Literature and Arts, and she will uh, graduate in 2012. For the future, she is planning to go back to America for her master's degree. Her biggest interest is to meet with new people from different cultures and nations. She plans to learn a new language and to travel to as many countries as she can. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming and I hope you'll enjoy. Uh, to be a feminist or not to be a feminist is my title. Uh, feminism is a belief and it aims that women should have the same rights and opportunities as men. This is the most common definition of feminism which is found in dictionaries. However, I have a few questions about this definition which I want to focus through my writing. Does the aim of feminism sound realistic? Does the aim of feminism reflect its essence? And does feminism is a solution for the women of today's world? Each day we encounter many problems, although we are living in a world of technology. The more we try to ease life, the more we face many difficulties. If a woman encounters a problem with a male gender, a medicine called feminism is given by Dr. Capitalism. Briefly, the history of feminism can be divided into three waves. The first wave appeared in the 19th and early 20th centuries. The second occurred in 1960s and 1970s and the third wave extends from the 1990s to the present. The first wave refers mainly to women's suffrage movement. The second wave refers to the ideas and actions associated with the women's liberation movement. And the third wave refers to the continuation of and a reaction to the perceived failures of second wave feminism. This is the general outline of feminism in history, which we learn during our courses in the universities. However, as a student, we are just, we are just learning these informations in order to pass the exams, but we are not questioning the realities, because realities always discomforts us and we usually prefer to escape from them. In general, we perceive feminism as forming an opposed group against men and as to not get married. The capitalist system tries to break the holiness of the marriage institutions under the term of feminism. Marriage is the only institution that allows two people to establish a very strong relationship. A healthy family with its mother, father and children is the guarantee for better tomorrows. But capitalism goes mad when it sees an order in the society. The conflict between men and women increases day by day, and the rate of divorce doubles its number each year. Whenever a problem occurs in the side of women, capitalism starts to produce the weapons of feminism against men. In some sense, capitalism uses feminism as a kind of shield. Firstly, my question is that, does, does the aim of feminism sound realistic? As I mentioned in the beginning, of my speech, the aim of feminism is to gain same rights as men. But what kind of rights and opportunities do women want when even a man is not equal inside of its own gender? If we try to classify the male gender according to his national, geographical, historical, social and economic status, we are to face with a huge gap. In order for women to seek the same equalities as men, a woman should determine the exact male character which she wants to be equated with. The general opportunities and rights given to men vary according to his social position in life. Therefore, in my opinion, instead of searching equality with men, women should search equality within its own female gender. On the other hand, 
Personally, I believe that both genders are being created equal by birth. God has created man and woman for each other to build a life together and to complete one another all life long. However, both genders have different physical and psychological differences. As we know, women are psychologically and physically more emotional, while men are physically strong and psychologically rational. Does the aim of feminism reflect its real essence? As a human being, we born, live and die. As a child, we born innocent, but as we grow older and older, we usually lose this innocence. So, like anything, feminism is born as innocent as a child. However, by time, as feminism began to become a victim of the capitalist system, feminism lost its purity and its originality. Capitalism manipulates feminism for the benefit of the system. Capitalism encourages more women to participate in public sphere. The more women participate in the public, the more capitalism gains its power. The game is very well planned. For instance, it is possible to see more women in the streets, shopping centers, restaurants than men. Take a pause for a few seconds and ask yourself the question, why do I work? The answer of the question is not too hard to guess. Capitalism is like a poisonous snake, which imposes the thoughts of anger, betrayal, envy, hypocrisy, pride, and many more. Today, many problems between men and women arise from the aims of capitalism. Thus, feminism is a solution for the problems of women of today's world. Time flows like a river and it's not possible to burn yesterday. Each day, women encounter many new problems. Women have become the puppets of the media. For instance, it is possible to see five women turning around one man in many TV programs. Female characters are usually represented in three ways in media. Firstly, girls are represented as having superpowers and are out to save the world. This is the female character which is imposed in cartoons or animations to kids between the ages of 5 through 12. Second, there is usually a teenage girl character that is able to find happiness among her friends. The message is enforced very explicitly. No man, no problem. Thirdly, women are rep represented as desperate housewives who are only dependent just their husbands and whose only duty is to clean, cook and look after children. We're about the reality. We're about the others. As we know, the world consists of many races, religions, languages, colors, customs and traditions. There are millions of women living all around the world. Chinese, Turkish, Russian, African, American and many more. And so, what are the criteria for being represented in the media? So, feminism for whom and for which woman's problem does feminism care for? Last of all, it is your choice to be a feminist or not to be a feminist. Thank you. questions at the end of the panel. So our second speaker is Yudum Alak. She was born into a Turkish family in London in 1992. Here, by going to primary and secondary school, she also attended the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. During her life in England, she took part in many charity and fundraising events, such as raising money to bring water to very rural areas in Africa. After finishing her secondary education, she moved to Izmir with her family. Here, she went to private Ashikant High School for five years. In 2010, she came to Ankara for her university education at Bilkent. In 2011, she became the student representative for the Department of English Language and Literature. She will probably have a career link to charity work. Now she is a second year student enjoying her university life. Hello everyone, first of all I'd like to thank all of you for coming to our conference. Uh, today I'll be talking about pornography and how it butchers women. Pornography is unfortunately a massive part of our lives and a huge part of mainstream culture. 
Even though we sometimes do not realise it, pornography is all around us, in our social environments, on the streets, in adverts, in magazines, shortly everywhere. It may be softcore or hardcore porn, but it's getting into people's lives from a very early age. Many children, boys and girls, are exposed to porn when they are quite young. This gives most of them a wrong idea about sex. The internet is not protected and it is very easy to log on to any kind of pornographic website. So this makes it easier for youngsters to check out pornographic material. In many countries, children do not receive sex education in school. For example, in England, children are taught in year five about the basics, puberty, etc. And one year later, they are taught completely about the facts of life. In many other countries, however, such as Turkey, sex is a taboo and it is not taught properly to students. So if these students don't get educated about sex, and if their parents don't tell them about it, they watch porn to relieve their curiosity. The films and images that they come across are not very realistic, but that's how the idea of sex remains in their heads. The portrayal of women in the porn movies is a very big problem. They are seen as sexual objects, only there for the needs and for the relief of the other male actors. And the way that they look and act has made many women in society feel self-conscious about themselves. The earliest example of pornography dates back to 1908. According to Patrick Robertson's film facts, it is called A l'écudo ou la bonne auberge, made in France. The plot depicts a wary soldier who has a tryst with a servant girl at an inn. Since then, it has taken up a large part of people's lives and time. Pornography not only gives the society a wrong image about sex, but it is also very degrading towards the women that act in it. Degradation is often linked to the objectification of women, that is, porn converts them into sexual objects. These women are abused, harassed and seen as sex toys for the pleasure of men. In these films, women are mostly humiliated and used as if they were a toy. However, when it comes to the porn industries, they commonly contest that violence towards women in porn is only fantasy. Even if it is so, it is hard for porn viewers to tell the difference between fantasy and reality, because many films are equally as brutal as each other. Women are shown reacting to aggressive acts with pleasure or neutrality, enforcing the idea that women enjoy being dominated and degraded during sex. Most of the time, the women are shouting in pain rather than pleasure. However, the industry makes it seem as if they're having a great time. There are so many disturbing images on the internet that it makes one think that they are normal. For example, in one video, a woman was tied up and was constantly hit and slapped by four men. They were having anal sex with her whilst she was screaming and crying and they were ejaculating on her face. Unfortunately, these are some of the most popular common types of porn films popular on the internet. Another very popular category is rape. There are lots of websites dedicated to videos of women being raped by their family members, strangers and by gangs. Many are not real, however, when you come to think about it, it is extremely upsetting that rape is a popular plot for a porn movie, let alone the fact that it is a crime. By looking at these examples, one can see that there is a connection between the porn industry and the porn viewer. If the viewers did not watch as much brutal and savage porn, then there would, be, there would not be as many videos. But once the industry sees how popular the title is, it starts making more videos under the same category. Boston sociology professor Gail Dine points out that the brutality of the industry has become such that most porn actresses have a shelf life of three months because their bodies are so physically damaged by the job. In some examples, such as anal sex, which has become extremely popular because of porn, damages women's bodies severely. And once the porn industry sees that women are not fit enough for any more films, they just throw her out. As if being humiliated isn't enough, their health is at risk. Most of them are drug addicts and sometimes just use them to ease the pain. The objectification of women in these videos has affected the society. Many men and even females have the wrong idea about sex. It is portrayed that women have no feelings or passion and that they are only there for the male sexual needs and pleasure. They are tortured, hit, slapped, strangled and all, all other kinds of things that could come to mind. 
Sorry. Women are mainly seen as second class citizens when compared with men in today's world and the depiction of them in pornography does not help at all. One cannot say that sexual harassment towards women or rape is linked with porn but the way it is showed in the films makes it seem as if it is normal in a relationship or nothing to be made a big deal about. These ideas of sex lead to unhealthy relationship and to women who hate their bodies. Porn stars are made to look so perfect that almost every woman would like to look like one. They are the exact mirror image of what the society oppresses women to look like. Tans with no tan lines, big breasts, fake nails, fake eyelashes, tiny waists, small nose, bleach blonde hair and extreme plastic surgery. However, porn movies are shot with extreme skill and they use different techniques to make the woman look like goddesses. For one thing, research has shown a very clear positive correlation in the amount of porn viewing and dissatisfaction with one's partner. In other words, studies show the more a man views porn, the less he is attracted to his partner. There is no question about this. The research is robust, repeated and clear. Obviously, women are feeling the consequences of porn in numerous ways. We see eating disorders, body loathing, plastic surgery and unrealistic expectations in girls and young women. We see women equating their worth to the form and its sexual attractiveness. We see depression and sorrow and the acceptance and normalization of objectifying women spreads throughout the world. Many women f fear sexual encounters with their partners because of their extreme requests. Even after leaving a career in porn, a woman is still not shown respect. Linda Susan Borman, better known by her stage name Linda Lovelace, was an American pornographic actress who was famous for her per performance of Deep Throat Fellatio in the enormous successful 1972 hardcore porn film Deep Throat. She later denounced her pornography career, claiming that she had been enforced into it by her first husband and for a while became a spokeswoman for the anti-pornography movement. She was forced into porn by her pimp husband. She says, They treated me like an inflatable plastic doll, picking me up and moving me here and there. They spread my legs this way and that, shoving their things at me and into me. They were playing musical chairs with parts of my body. I have never been so frightened and disgraced and humiliated in all my life. I felt like garbage. I engaged in sex acts for pornography against my own will to avoid being killed. The lives of my family were threatened. After having to go through all of this against her own will, it soon became her lifestyle. After leaving the porn industry, she spoke out against pornography, stating that she had been abused and coerced. She spoke before feminist groups at colleges and before government hearings on pornography. There was controversy over her allegations and her objections to the pornography industry as a whole. Pornographer and writer Hart Williams coined the term Linda Syndrome to refer to women who leave pornography and repudiate their past career by condemning the industry. One cannot completely blame the porn industry, but on the other hand cannot also completely blame the woman herself. In conclusion, there's a clear link between porn and between mainstream society culture. All of the false images have created a society full of oppressed women. The men unfortunately see most of them as sex toys during sex and they are mainly treated as if they have no feelings. Even though there are anti-porn activists and there is not enough awareness about the reality of porn, the way it affects our lives, our sex life and the way men see women. If, since a young age, people are exposed to these kinds of images and if they are bombarded with scenes of harassment, what else can we expect from their actions? Uh, now I'm going to show two minutes of a video about an ex-porn star. As soon as that movie started rolling, I started editing. As soon as the camera said cut and they were finished, I remember how horrible and shattered I felt. You can see the machine and the degradation comes. And someone says, here's a rag, you wipe your face up. On the movie set, it's absolutely horrible and degrading for women. In the back room, you can hear women throwing up. You can hear them crying because it hurts. 
It's absolutely disgusting to work on a movie set. It's a totally unregulated industry. You walk into a movie set and there's animal boxes all over. There's piles of used rags in the corner. And that's basically what we're staring at while every man takes his turn. You know what women do before they do a scene? We go outside with other porn actors. We lay down lines of meth. We take big bottles, chug that down, and we're ready. We're ready to take the abuse and the degradation. And then right in the middle of the act, when it hurts so bad, you bite down on an invisible bullet. And you take the pain and you check it out. What happened to me was any piece of shell that was left from prostitution totally died on the set. And I became Roxy. And I hated my life. And I despised my very existence. And I cried out to God again, get me out of this, you get me out of this, I'll serve you my whole life. And as you know, in the industry we do not there's not, we don't use condoms. And so every single day we live in fear that we're going to catch a sexually transmitted disease or worse, HIV. Every day we live, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, who slept with who? And um, I got burned. I caught genital herpes and I thought I was going to die. It was absolutely the worst thing. It's the most shameful. I had dealt with so much shame already. This was terrible. Thank you very much, Yudu. Now, do you have any questions? I want to thank you for this inspiring um, presentations. Uh, my question would be for Yudu. Um, actually, I remember reading some news about uh, some women who acted against this um, por porn industry and the male gaze in porn industry and therefore they uh, um, did their own porn, sold porn for women and they have used males who are well built because they were saying that males are not, uh, not good looking but uh, it's just the male gaze that shows women and all males are in a way neglected in that sense so uh, we should use, we should do porn for women because in the industry all porns are for men and they are not soft porns and women need soft porns. And what do you think about this movement and do you think that it is a, a kind of resistance against this porn industry or do, does it reproduce again I mean, the dangers you already um, said and also um, have you read Snuff by Chuck? Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, translated as a yeah. so it was not allowed in Turkey. Yeah, but, but um, it's not. It's not and the uh, translator was detained, I think, because of translating this book. But it was, um, it is told right now. And I was going to ask about something about that. But anyway, what do you think about this? Uh, so, are you saying that uh, soft porn movement? Mm -hmm. Because nearly all porn is made for the viewing of men. That mm -hmm. there should be porn for women. Yeah, and they were doing soft porn for women. Well, uh, after researching about this topic, I actually found that pornography is, I mean, really putting off and disgusting uh, these kinds of pornography, but. Uh, the amount of pornography made for men, obviously, uh, there should be pornography made for women. But, I mean, if it's on the grounds of a mutual respect, and if, I mean, people are not degraded, if women are not degraded and men are not degraded, and it's more soft, soft core than hard core, well, I think it's all right. It should be, it could be done. Just a humble advice for my friends, maybe, if they are interested. I have watched Lucas Modison's A Hole in My Heart. Actually, I couldn't watch it because it was so good. <laughs> it is weird, but um, it, it just gives you the, the 
idea be, I mean, behind this industry and what women and what men actually and how they are victimized, how uh, they are exposed to such violence and psychological and physical and all. And if they're interested, they can watch it uh, if they can finish it until the end. Hi, uh, my question is to you. Uh, pornography is seen as an indispensable part of today's culture. And do you think it can be got rid of? Do you think it should be? And for example, let me ask it like that. Um, if you have a son uh, in teen years, how would you educate him about pornography? How would you let him watch it, for example? Oh, well, uh, when you said, uh, do you think we can get rid of it? Well, uh, I actually don't think that it can be get rid of because uh, sex is like the main thing in human beings' lives. And that's why pornography is this, this much popular. So, uh, I mean, even if it can't be got, got rid of, maybe uh, it, there should be more awareness about the fact that, I mean, it's degrading to males and females as well. Uh, moving on to the next part of your question, uh, well, I think that one of the main problems of young children watching porn so much is because of the lack of uh, knowledge that they have about sex. So I think that uh, children, if they're more educated about sex and what it really is, I mean, between two people uh, with passion and with love, not without feelings, <coughs> I think that, I mean, if they're educated like this, then maybe the problem of young children watching porn could be stopped. Any other questions? Well, we can finish the session. Thank you for your attendance. And welcome to the last session of our conference. Uh, this this uh, session is entitled "Representations of Women on Female uh, Representations of the Female on Sydney." I'm sorry. Uh, our first speaker is Mehta Akbash. Mehta Akbash was born in Diyarbakir in 1989. She attended Diyarbakir Anatolian Teachers Training High School. She received her bachelor's degree from Bihar University, English Language and Literature Department in 2011 with full scholarship. She is now doing her MA degree in Cultural Studies, studies at Istanbul Shehir University with full scholarship. Her areas of interest are women, gender, sex workers, and ethnicity. And now we are listening to her paper. Thank you so much for your applause. Before my presentation, I hope I will receive them after that. Um, I really want to thank to the uh, conference committee for their contribution to this conference and I thank you for your acceptance for me as an MA student and it's really comforting to be back home representing to you. Um, I'll talk about Yanzlar Rıhtımen ve Skaliyarim, Ömer Lütfakat's two movies. But um, I want to warn you that I omitted so many parts because of time limit. But still, I hope you will enjoy my presentation. And before beginning to it, my presentation, I want to also add that using Akat's woman is deliberate here. Um, and it is to highlight how women are depicted and represented in Turkish cinema from a male's gaze. Um, I think I can begin. This paper aims at elaborating on Lütfi Ömer Akat's two movies, which are Yalnızlar Rıhtımı and Vesikalı Yarim. Being a prolific director who passed away quite recently, Akat draws different types of women in these two movies. One being a passive and subordinate woman, and the other being a more liberated one, who is in search of her own identity and who is after her decisions. Therefore, this paper will handle Akat's women in their relation to men and society as the dominant entities, together with their relation to space. 
Hanzlar Rıhtımı has a scenario covering both a group of dishonest men doing trade, destroying each other for the sake of money, and a love story between a sailor man Rıdvan, Sadri Alışık, and Contes Güner, Çolpan İlhan, whose master seems to be Ali, Turgut Özatay, one of the dishonest traders. I can show you the poster of the movie. And although Contes Güner is freed from Ali's domination at the end of the movie, it can be interpreted as an exchange between two male dominants, since Güner just goes from a patronage to the other one. However, in Vesikalı Yarim, Akat presents a more convincing and philanthropic approach to the whole romanticism of Turkish cinema, says Giovanni Sikognamillo. Because in Vesikalı Yarim, Sabiha, Türkan Şoray, is a barrel girl, a consumatrice, that is a whore in the eyes of men, entertaining male customers by her conversation and femaleness. Yet, she meets Halil, an honest grocer man, who happens to be at that bar at that time. She finds love of his life, who is a married man, as she learns later. In love with Sabiha, Halil leaves his wife with two kids and moves in with her. Then Sabiha decides to leave Halil because of his family and pretends to have grown disinterest in him. Here, the important point which differentiates this movie from Yalnızlar Rıhtımı is that Sabiha is a woman in search of her, her own identity and decisions. She is not as passive and subordinate as Güner, whom we will see as a puppet, actually. Women in relation to men in Yalnızlar Rıhtımı and Vesikalıyar. In order to begin focusing on female characters of these movies, the main thing should be done first is to refer to Simone de Beauvoir to highlight how women are seen in all patriarchal societies. As she says, humanity is male and man defines women, not in herself but in relation to himself. She is not considered an autonomous being. She is the inessential in front of the essential. He is the subject, he is the absolute, she is the other. It can be one of the famous quotations of all time when it comes to the position of women. Yet it should be repeated over and over again, because unfortunately nothing has changed since she uttered these words in 1949. While the society operates within this pretext for women, cinema does not reflect anything different by conforming Laura Murray's convention that the spectral look in mainstream cinema is implicitly male. The image represents the ideological meaning that women has for men. The male as active and powerful and the female as passive and powerless subject, on which power is exercised either as a victim or as an object that needs to be protected and the spectator identifies with the male look. As understood from the quotation, women are represented in the cinema in relation to men. What they have is only for men. They are to be protected and governed. For instance, Contes Güner is a perfect representation of this male gaze and domination. She is the singer of the bar and also the mistress of the owner of that bar, Ali. When Güner decides to do something by herself, it is obviously not permitted. In a scene they quarrel, Ali asks, who made you a contest? Who rescued you from the dump? Meaning prostitution in this context. And she answers, you. And then she again returns to her old self being a puppet governed by Ali. Her initial struggle to be herself is prohibited all at once. By making her a contest, as if Gunnar didn't have any talent or to sing or act in a stage, Ali seems to have all the rights of Gunnar for his own good. However, in Vesikalı Yarim, Sabiha as a bar girl again, belongs to the bar and the owner of the bar, yet she is not a mistress. She still has her, her own space to behave accordingly. But still, she, Turkan Şuray, has all her femme fatale beauty for men in the movie and for the men in the audience. Choosing Turkan Şuray to act this role is quite meaningful in that sense. Because Turkan Şuray is the embodiment of male desire of the time with her big oriental brown eyes, plumpness, and beauty different from western blondes, as it is similarly stated by Don Maskolin. The star system born in 1960s typecast four top stars according to the audience expectations.
Türkan Şoray, The Oppressed Sexual Woman. Hülya Koçit, The Oppressed Asexual Woman. Filiz Akın, The Well-Educated Asexual Bourgeois Woman. <gülüyor> And Fatma Girik, The Honest Manly Asexual a sexual woman known as erkek Fatma, <laughs> male Fatma, which didn't mean masculine by the way, but rather honest and straightforward like a man. Therefore, it is significant to see the oppressed sexual woman, Türkan Şoray, acting this bar girl, blowing Halil's mind with her beauty and sexuality, since Halil has never seen a süslü ve boyalı kadın. A coquettish woman with makeup. I want to show you a video of this blowing scene. <laughs> Bir sigara içebilir miyim? Yakar mısın? Totally mesmerized by her. <gülüyor> Emre abicim. Bir içki ısmarla sana bana. Ne istiyorsa getir. Masayı da temizle. Konya. Su, buz isteme. But as stated before, she is more liberated and independent than Güner, in that she can take decisions and act accordingly. When it comes to how society defines these women, it is obvious that they are seen as fallen women. They are the embodiment of male desire, yet they are not respected. They are not suitable daughters, wives or mothers. As obvious, Contest Güner's family is never mentioned. It is obvious that she has nobody. When Halil asks Sabiha about a picture, the audience learns that her mother is dead. She is also alone. She is actually not possessed by a family, not protected by a family, which outcasts her automatically since a woman is not an autonomous being. When Halil continues to ask questions about Sabiha's life, she says, Amman be, amma da sordun. Nasıl düştüğümü de öğrenmek ister misin? You asked too much. Do you want to learn how I fell? Here, referring to the notion of fallen woman. As an answer, to, as an answer, Halil just shakes his head, saying no, and bows his head towards the floor because Sabiha trans the so-called terra incognita. When it comes to Contest Güner, in a scene, total, total male perception of her is revealed as Ali talks to Ridwan about Güner. He says that, Burada çürük meyveden başka bir şey bulamazsın. You cannot find anything other than rotten fruit here. Referring to the fallen woman notion again, using the metaphor of a fruit, which can also be seen as an indication of Eve and the forbidden fruit. In addition, in these movies, the conservative values of the society that limit, limit women's freedom is presented as well. That is why Sabiha cannot find happiness in the end because she is a fallen woman who tries to stand on her feet without male domination. The reason Güler finds happiness in spite of being fallen is her being submissive. Not behaving as an autonomous being alone can eliminate the possible consequences of being fallen. As for fallen women in image in Yeşilçam, Colin Sönmez states, Yeşilçam endorsed the conservative values of society and sacrosanctity of marriage. Sexuality was reserved for the bad woman. The vamps, the prostitutes, could kiss, undress and make love, but innocent family girls never took off their clothes and never went to bed, and fallen women, although honorable, never found happiness. In both movies, it is seen that Gunnar and Sabiha are quite sexual, and they kiss, enjoy, drink and smoke. Gunnar is a puppet, and hence ideal for men, 
and therefore she deserves happiness that is granted to her. However, Sabiha presents a self-governing identity. That's why she cannot find happiness in the end. This happiness of Gunnar is granted one to be enjoyed under the auspicious of male dominance. And the thing is that this happiness actually is the absolute contention of marriage, which should be questioned. Moreover, women are absent, as Lacan states. They become visible through their relationship to men. In these cases, it is obviously seen that Gunnar becomes visible through her relation to Ali first, as a mistress, and then to Ridwan. But for Ridwan, she's on her way to be an honorable wife. As for Sabiha, she's a barrel girl, a prostitute first, but then she becomes a housewife for a short while, and her life is devoted to Halil. And it's best romanticized when she irons Halil's stuff, and her friend comes to, make, to take her back. And I want to show this scene. <laughs> Canının çekmesine karışmam ama aptallığına bozulur. Ha, arada bir çıkarsın Halil'inle, kalırsın da daimi oturmasın. Senin para tutacak, istif yapacak zamanın şimdi. Hangi pavyonda, hangi yevmiyeli istersen alırsın. Birkaç katta iç çamaşırı lazım. Olduğu gibi geliver de hiçbir şeysiz. Sana olanlar olmuş, patron söylediği zaman inanmamıştım, o da şaşkınlar. <gülüyor> Gömlek yanacak. Bari çok paralı biriyle yapsaydın şu işi. Herifi yontsaydın yüreğim gam yemezdi. Ne anasının gözü elfmiş be, hiç de umulmaz halinde. Bitti mi lafın? Sen o herifteyken biter mi hiç? And you see how romanticized being a housewife is. And in this scene, the audience is given the perfect binary of position defined by men, Madonna and whore. Therefore, it is obvious that women are absent, but they become visible in re their relation to men. And this visibility contains two dichotomies of being a Madonna or a whore. In addition, another important woman character is Halil's wife. And the way she is portrayed in the movie is quite significant. She is depicted as an opposition to Sabiha, as it is obvious. She exactly stands for the type of women who are brought up to serve their husbands. Her absence, in Lacanian words, in any, is annihilated through her relation to Halil. The reason for her not to be seen in the screen alone can be because of this. She is always seen in, in the screen with Halil. Until the end of the movie, she is not shown to the audience. When Halil goes back to his house, she says nothing. She lays the bed for him and then she asks the functional question whether he is hungry or not. She is there to prepare Halil's bed, meal, clothes and to nurture the children. She is not a woman to go to entertainment or to Chamluja, like Sabiha. And here I can show you the wife. Halil is returning back from Sabiha's submissive after his betrayal it is as if nothing happened
I think it's enough. You get the idea how she behaves and the, um, mind the architecture of the house. I'll talk about it later. Just an, a room that they use for all of these things, for sleeping, eating, procreating. As it can be deduced from both movies, women are referential beings who cannot live without male protection. They are seen as ob subjects to be possessed and exchanged. When they try to find their own path, they are meant to be facing the world alone, in the pretext of men, just like Sabiha does at the end of the movie. Now I'm passing to the use of space and characters' relation to it in these movies. When Akats, these two movies are analyzed carefully. The importance of Istanbul as a living city, the way it is related to the characters and the boundaries of public and domestic sphere for women are recognized. It can be said that women who use both spheres, domestic and private, freely are the fallen women. Sabiha follows Halil in the street without informing him. When Halil rebukes him, she, her, she says, he says, sorry, you go out without informing me. You come home here, but do not speak to me. Which hints that, as housewives, women have to find reasonable excuses to be out in the streets. For instance, in order to prepare food for the men of the house and maybe for shopping from the bazaar. As for Güner, the audience sees her always in the company of men, be it, be it either Ridwan or Ali, when she is in the public sphere. As stated before, she is not as disobedient as Sabiha. That is why she deserves happiness at the end, which is still in male company. The women of public sphere, especially of bars, are generally portrayed as, portrayed as fallen women. On the contrary, as an ideal wife and a mother, we are presented with Halil's wife, who is quite dependent and obedient. She is caged in her house, the domestic sphere. It is obvious that women are seen as the subjects of domestic sphere to be possessed and protected. Women are seen as subjects whose boundaries are shaped by the domestic sphere that is dominated and protected by men. Whenever decent women are out in public sphere, they are there for a reason that serves to men, or men accompany them. The ones who are in entertainment sector are fallen ones, and women cannot attend such places just for fun, the ideal women, I mean. Another significant theme related to space is the image of the house. In these two movies, at the beginning, Gunnar is drunk and says to Ridwan that she's not feeling well and wants to go home. After the, this incident, Ridwan says to his friend, Tuhaf değil mi böyle birazdan ev lafı duymak? Which is, isn't it weird hearing the word of house from such a person? And adds that most probably she is living in a hotel and exploited by his employers, who gives her no home. As understood, the common notion is that houses are not for fallen women. They are for daughters, wives and mothers. In other words, they are for decent women. That is why Ridwan here challenged this common notion of the society and says this in a pitying way. Then, throughout the movie, a small house as the ultimate hope and desire of Günar is articulated and repeated by her. The only thing she wants is a house, which can also be interpreted as to be a wife, because she is also obsessed with the bride's gown, as mentioned. The house symbolizes a woman's acceptable and honorable position in the society. With a house to stay, they become someone's wife, just like Halil's wife, and justify the reason when they leave, why they leave. In Vescali Aram, the same notion prevails. The most obvious scene is when Halil, the breadwinner of the house, brings stuff to the house. When they are in the kitchen and arranging what is brought, Sabiha says, Halil, şimdi burası bir ev oldu. Ondan önce ne bileyim, bir barın aktı sadece. Which means, Halil, now it feels like home. It was like a shelter before. Here, it is understood that a house means a male breadwinner in the position of a husband. However, Sabiha has been earning before Halil. She has been self-sufficient until Halil comes. The society's percep perception of a house with a master that is presented in the movie and the way it is internalized by women can be best explained with what Cecil Sovich writes. When the woman loves, she must forget her own personality. This is, this is a love of nature. A woman does not exist without a master. Without a master, she is a scattered bouquet. Therefore, 
What is seen is that society perceives a house as a domestic sphere, caging a woman with a male master, and women internalize it wholeheartedly. Therefore, they become ideal women. In addition, the architecture of the houses is quite revealing in that they help portray the woman's character's identity. Contest Gunnar, with her girl girlfriend, lives in a hotel room that is composed of two rooms. These two, two are bedrooms. The audience is not provided with anything like kitchen, bathroom, or likewise, which symbolizes Gunnar's character only as a contest. She is not a housewife, daughter, or a mother. Her only function is to give pleasure to men, as the bedroom suggests. As for Sabiha, the situation is different. In her shelter, which turns out to be a house with Halil's arrival, she has a separate bedroom that is modernly decorated, containing a painting of a nude woman over her double bed, symbolizing her role as fallen woman, giving pleasure to men. In her living room, she has a bar for alcohol, which seems to be quite extraordinary for an ideal woman as society defines. She has a separate kitchen. Again, the architecture of her house suggests that although she is an already fallen woman, she can be a total housewife as she proves later by preparing meals to serve for Halil, by ironing his clothes, by shopping in the bazaar. As for Gunnar, she is far from portraying a separate identity of hers. As for Halil's wife, what is obvious is that the house she lives in is quite functional for sleeping, procreating and eating. They have a single functioning room for all of these which differentiates her from Sabiha. Sabiha's bedroom or the huge table in the living room is not for basic needs of procreating and eating, but for enjoying as well. In his life with Sabiha, Halil becomes himself an individual with desires, yet with his wife, he becomes a member of the society to serve, serve it by working and procreating. He is far from being an individual with desires. Halil's wife, similarly serves to be society, to the society, just like his husband when he's with her, therefore does not present an individual character. In short, in Yanzarat Man Veskaliarim, Akat uses public and domestic sphere and the image of house with a name. These movies present an inter intertwined relationship of space and characters, both in the society and the movie. As I said, I omitted some parts because of time limit. I don't want to steal my friend's house and your house, <laughs> time and your time. So um, I'm leaving the lyrics analysis. If For those who are interested, we can discuss it individually. And I'll leave you with the songs. As the end. Arasını takdim ediyoruz. Yılın en süksele şarkısını söyleyen Contest Güner.
back with his wife and children. Thank you, and um, I would like to wave our final thanks and congratulations from Ege University to Bill Kent for uh, hosting us here and um, inviting us to uh, present our papers. And I would also like to uh, dedicate this paper and presentation to my friend Esra, who introduced me with the subject and the TV series United States of Terra. Although she is not here, considering the fact that I am recorded by the video recorder right now, I know that <laughs> she will be informed. And uh, uh, up to now, we talked about um, gender roles as feminine and masculine roles in the society and I would like to go a little bit deeper in the subject and I would like to uh, think about the other roles that a uh, woman has to play and act in the society that we have differentiated roles in our uh, lives as we know it. And uh, okay. okay. Uh, I will begin with uh, introducing the uh, multiple personality disorder or, or um, currently known as dissociative identity disorder uh, very briefly. Actually, um, okay, multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder is defined as a psychological illness in which the individual has two or more personalities and experiences alterations according to the situation that the individual cannot cope with. These personalities are divided selves and called alter egos or alternate egos. DID generally appears as a result of past trauma or extreme social repression. Because the person diagnosed with DID presents unsuitable actions in community, he or she is generally perceived as schizoid, and the disease is labeled as schizophrenia. However, it is named as grandi hysteria in pathological literature. As the name directly calls to mind the association of the word hysteria with women, 
Women can be said to be more prone to go through such a disorder. However, it is a very rare case which does not enable the psychiatrists and psychologists to study the ID in more detail. Hence, rather than being academically popular, uh, DID syndrome has been the subject of few movies and novels. Apart from strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, which focuses on two split personalities of the protagonist, Three Faces of Eve and Sybil, the latter adapted from a novel by Floretta Schreiber, are true stories of women who suffered from DID. United States of Terra, on the other hand, is a three-season TV series forecasted in showtime between the years 2009 and 2011, starring Tony Collette and directed by, by Diablo Cody. Tara is, a diagno is diagnosed as a DID person. She struggles to find a cure to her mental illness with her loving husband, Max, teenager daughter, Kate, and homosexual vintage son, Marshall. Tara has three major dissociated selves or divided selves or alternate egos who are defined as the subpersonalities taking control of the body each time the self cannot cope with the difficult situation in life. Tara's male alter ego is a Vietnam veteran, Alice. Uh, Buck, Tara's male alter ego, is a Vietnam veteran. Alice, the vintage housewife. T, 16-year-old teenager with excessive libido. Whenever Tara gets into hardship caused by the society or by the problems in the family, she shifts from herself to one of the alter egos. Although the situation is quite pathologic, it is not actually very different from what any healthy individual experiences in his or her daily life. Considering the different roles that we are up to perform in community, it is similar to the situation of DID that we respond to the requirements of the environment with our differentiated masks and scripts that are handed to us since our childhood. So we shift our shapes constantly to survive in a way. Thinking of women, on the other hand, their performance of female gender is more split according to the needs or the expectations of the environment. A woman is a mother, a child, a wife, and a, ver and a worker at the same time. And each performance of which serves to different needs. Mother as the reproductive and breeding body, child as the unprotected, unsexed organism, wife as the sexual object, and worker as strong, masculine, self-confident robot. Tara, apart from her dissociated personalities, which is a pathological case, is also divided to different roles cor uh, corresponding to the expectations of the American society. She is caring mother of Kate and Marshall, both of whom are quite problematic teenagers, and a loving wife to Max to satisfy his sexual needs, and she is an artist who feels the need to be creative all the time to make a living. Hence, her alters not only try to satisfy the demands of the society, but they are counterfeits of the family members in a way. In the initial episode of the first season, we are introduced with Crazy T, who wears Kate's clothes and acts like a 16-year-old girl. T is the correspondence of Tara's daughter, Kate, for Tara, as an adult, cannot cope with the unprotected sexual intercourses of Kate with her peers. As Tara transforms into T unintentionally, she suggests Kate to use contraceptive pills and she helps her to get a prescription for the, for the pills from the doctor. However, Mother Tara would never perform this kind of help for her daughter, Kate, because she thinks that it is too early for her to get into sexual intercourse, which may end up with pregnancy. Although T is the, an alter ego who appeared before the birth of Kate, 
It functions as a mask to help Tara in putting her relationship with her daughter in order. Secondly, T is the prostitute side of Tara, who is desired and dismissed by the society at the same time, as individuals in a community wishes to be f too free to act in the way they desire, but they are constantly restricted by the morals put forward by the other's borders of action. Tara supersedes the borders of her other rules uh, det determined by the community. Alice is another alter ego who is a perfect housewife with the taste of 50s, learning French, believing God, and talented in housework. Her correspondence in Tara's environment is Marshall, who also has the vintage taste of uh, clothes, and Marshall is the cook of the house, as the self Tara is never enough to deal with the things in the kitchen. However, Alice is significant for her other mirror, who is the nanny of five-year-old Tara and her sister Charmaine. In the forthcoming episodes, the audience is informed that Tara and her sister were given to a foster care because of the mentally sick stepbrother Bryce's abuse of Tara. The woman to whom the children were given is just like Alice, keeping everything under, under control with her meticulous house care. Tara's psychology develops Alice as a counter defense to Bryce's abduction in her childhood. She creates an independent, untouchable, elegant woman model that is eluded from the experience of rape. Alice is also a kind of response to the society's expectations from Tara as a woman in terms of her moral, uh, moral style of living, which does not clash or contradict with the norms and the forms. Alice cooks a deliciously ornamented cake, for instance, for the charity sale of Marshall School, which shocks the other women there who does not expect Tara to achieve such a thing, so to accomplish the needs and expectations of the society. And Tara, on the other hand, needs to protect herself and her family in a masculine way, for she is vulnerable because of the trauma she went through when she was a little girl. In accordance with the necessity, alter ego Buck appears. Buck is a so-called Vietnam veteran who wears max clothes and speaks a masculine slang language. It is interesting that he is the only character who is left-handed. He is protected and strong like Max. Consequently, he mirrors the role of Tara's husband. When Tara learns that she was abused by her half-brother Bryce, it is Buck who chases the trace of where Bryce lives, and Buck calls all the Bryces in Overland Park, Kansas City, and threatens them to death. In the second episode of the first season, Arthur Buck beats Kate's boyfriend who maltreated her, so we can say that Buck is the defense tower of Terra. And on the other hand, there is another interesting scene that Buck uh, gets into sexual intercourse with a barmaid who is named as Pam. Pam is actually um, quite attractive for Terra's uh, husband, Max, in one of the you know, uh, episodes. And uh, as Terra cannot cope with the really, really hard situation in the family because the situation was quite chaotic and no one, no one can deal with that situation. So uh, Tara transforms into Buck and gets into sexual, course, sexual intercourse with Pam, the barmaid. And it is quite different that uh, when ten, Tony Collette is asked about the, you know, about the scene, what do you think that? Is there, is there some kind of curing the gender in that scene that transgressing the borders of you know, sexuality? And uh, Tony Collette answered the question as, Buck is a man, Buck feels that he is a man, he is a true man, so he, get, he got into sexual intercourse with Pam as a man, not, a, not as a woman, so it is not a homosexual act, it is a heterosexual act, in fact. Anyway, and all the other egos, I may say, counting Shoshana, the psychologist, and Chicken, the little Tara, is protective not only over Tara, but also over the family. However, Tara cannot escape from impersonating Bryce as one of the other egos who desires to give hazard to their Tara and her environment, remembering that Bryce is the abuser of Tara, the little Tara, who caused this kind of disorder to appear. 
Bryce aims to kill the other alter egos in order to seize the whole control of the body of Terra. It is quite interesting that she initiates the Stockholm Syndrome years after the event. Terra's mentality is afraid to get hurt by Bryce second time, and instead of handling with the matter with the collaboration of the other alters and her self-identity, she gives the possession of her body to her abuser because this time it will not be somebody else than herself who would get the damage to her. Tara constantly transforms into something other than herself in order to be herself, never unified, never as a whole. However, this is not only the transformation process of our protagonist, but also the initiation journey of the other characters in the TV series. First of all, Kate transforms from, from the chaotic teenager to a more mature and aware individual who wants to pursue a career to make a living with a more dignified boyfriend. Kate is the girl with the long hair. And Marshall follows his dreams of being a filmmaker beside his sexual orientation as a homosexual. So he casts for um, his sexual identity throughout the TV series, if you watch it. Tara's carefree, selfish sister Charmaine learns to love someone not just for the financial or physical qualities and eventually admits to Mary Neal, who is a short, fat guard gardener, later a truck driver, as he is, in, he is the father of Charmaine's primary baby. Max, on the other hand, was very patient and understanding husband to Tara, but because his nerves are quite tired of Bryce's destructive actions, he finally exhorts his anger for the miserable situation situation of the others in the family. Tara's situation in a way serves as a catalyst for the transformation of the other characters in the TV series. Tara's true self, which is believed to be so, is the only one who believes that everything is going to be fine in the end. Although she is a sick person, only she believes the transformation from bad to good, despite her contradictions with her memory loss because of the alterations which take place in difficult situations. And also, uh, I would like to mention Max's mother, who uh, did not uh, get out of the house for about 20 years, and uh, collecting all the Christmas presents in her house, and she just makes a trash of the whole house with the, with the um, reminiscences of the past memories. But uh, as the things get even, hard, get even harder, Max's mother uh, thinks that it is high time to get out of the house and help her son Max. And uh, she steps out from the house to, um, to help Max to go to his house. Desa Bradley claims in her article on the hostile tolerance in the United States of Terra that this TV series, quote, explores the com complexity of female identity in a postmodern context. And like the spectacle of Carnival, identifying with Terra enables the audience to play with multiple manifestations of identity and to contest the dominant gender narrative at least temporarily, unquote. In another way, United States of Terra offers an alternative to the gender issue in an interesting way, which utilizes the moral codes of contemporary society of America, which in Desi's terms is supposed to embrace all kinds of differences from all walks of life. Although her alter's actions push the audience to the borders of anger, her situation is of sympathy to most of the, our audience because it is the only way to cope with the excessive expectations of the community to be performed by the individual. That is why the manifestations of the different personalities in Terra can be also conceived as something desirable, for they transgress the borders of normality in order to achieve the struggle of the postmodern life, daily life. Does Terra want to be cured? Does she really want to get rid of the outer trashes of, him, of whom she has to clean up? Does she aim to break up the liberal hold of her mentality in order to establish her ultimate monarchy as a unique, coherent self-identity? 
In first global conference titled as Femininity and Masculinity in 2011 in Poland, Sarah Lekosai, in her paper, United States of Terra, Gender Trouble in Popular Culture, mentions that the title of the TV series has two functions. One, identifying the existence of different personalities in a body, not mingling with each other, and the other, being Terra's effort to accomplish the different expectations of the American society. She also mentions Elif Shafak's prominent autobiographic novel, Black Milk, for Shafak indicates the small women inside her brain, each of whom poses different identities and makes Shafak an individual. Just like Shafak, who wants to pacify the sound of the inner choir of the tiny women, Tara gathers all of her altars to one imaginary room to set her own monarchy, letting them write down what they want Tara to do for them in exchange for her freedom uh, from these divided selves. Let's see how she does this. These things will bend to my will. I will be in control. Me, Tara. End of story. I am sick and tired of all the craziness. This is all your fault. With the drugs and black me, Stepford. Back had a big night out. I wasn't even here. I was doing important stuff. Just having a beard of cuisine. I, for one, think it's about time you asserted yourself. Absolutely. It's a wonderful... Shut the fuck up! Ooh, Tara, you just got the effort. Can we just drown her? The dogs? <laughs> Far too long babying you, all of you. You act like spoiled brats and then you leave me holding the bag. So, we are going to draw up a contract. All of you write down what's important to you and what you want out of life. And then I, and I alone, will decide how to go about it. Don't sound like no democracy to me. Well, it ain't. But I am dissolving the United States of Terra and declaring myself king. And if any of y'all don't like it, you can Kiss my ass, cause I'll go back on the drugs, and you'll go back in the closet. Well, this sucks. Fine. dictatorship to be in full effect. Long live the king. Meets me in a field of stone. She says I don't know how I'm supposed to feel. Body's cold, my guts are twisted steel. I'm crazy. <laughs> I feel like I'm so kind of Frankenstein. I'm fucking crazy. Waiting for a shot to bring me back to life. But I don't want to spend my Nevertheless, she ends up with the ink on the edge of her mouth, as you all see, and scrapes all over the desk, the papers, and on her arms towards the end of her abnormal psychology exam in the college. 
she constantly struggles to get rid of them, but she loves them, the elders, and in fact learns from their experiences, which they have gained when Terra the self was not around, like she as she divides in her daily life for different roles as Terra the mother, Terra the wife, Terra the sister, and Terra the artist. Charmaine's friend Tiffany sympathizes Terra and asks the question, during a day, how many different women do we have to be? I have, be, I have to be the Tiffany at work, the sexy Tiffany, or the Tiffany who, who has got dogs. I find it hard to do. Another female character, Linda, who is an artist of mythological figures who draws the um, paintings of Princess Valhalla, who is actually Kate, Tara's daughter. Because Linda, is, Linda herself is another outcast in the society due to her attitude of alienation from the expectations. At least she lives in a garage and she refuses to pay the tax that he hegemonic government demands. Transformations has taken place throughout the history of the humankind, most of whom, most of which are initiation stories of male figures setting sail abroad, killing a lot of people, rejecting the women or utilizing them as sexual objects, and coming back home matured and tired of wisdom. However, women in the history who somehow transformed into something other than themselves have been the witches innate evils, punished prostitutes, or dismembered sexual objects. Remembering Daphne, who transformed into a laurel tree to escape from the rape of Apollon, who is a god, and Canis, who transformed into a man after the rape of Poseidon, women have altered many shapes to survive the violence directed to their fragility from the traumas they have gone through in order to pose a healthier attitude. They have never, but they have never been fully appreciated for their harmonic existence all through these different lines they are expected to read and act in proper way. That is what United States of Terra criticizes in some, and left with many question marks about whether she will transform into a single identity or not. Thank you. Thank you, Marva. Uh, now we will be listening to Tuba Urash. Tuba Urash attended Gaziantep College Foundation School from 2004 to 2007 and graduated as the second highest ranking student. She is now a fourth year student in English Language and Literature Department at Gaziantep University. Uh, she is interested in movies, poetry, classical music and literature. She knows German as well as English as foreign languages and she has a certificate in English teaching. She, has, she worked as a trainee teacher in Ayşe Mustafa Sercan Primary School. And uh, she is planning to get a master's degree in English language teaching. And now we are listening to her paper. Thank you for uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, before my presentation, uh, I want to show a video.
The film adaptation of the Margaret Atwood novel with the same name is a point of the roles of women in mo uh, modern society by showing the uh, feminist negative uh, utopia, uh, the disunity of women, the, the, uh, the dehumanization of women, and the destruction of female solidarity through the uh, system uh, in which women have a particular role. The tale stresses uh, the power of Gilead and not to uh, futuristic society and criticizes uh, a totalitarian regime uh, that, be that behaves uh, cruelly uh, towards women. Uh, the subject which is visualized with the film touches on uh, some feminist writers thought in the film Women are uh, seen only with their biological role as uh, two, two legged worms. As Simone de uh, Beauvoir thinks that because women are reduced to uh, serv servicing men through her sex for either pleasure or procreation, women are uh, exploited. Beauvoir describes the way in which she behaves. Uh, she believes a woman in, is born and exists physically as a woman, but it is not uh, her physical state that conducts her destiny as a woman. It is rather that uh, she is constructed as a woman by society. In The Handmaid's Tale, the Gilead society blames women's uh, reproductive function for the decreasing birth rate and the constant uh, rise of infertility in the state. Thus, uh, women are transformed to, to the traditional passive roles of mothers. Edward depicts uh, the disunity of women primarily through Gilead's system in which women are assign, uh, assigned a particular role of giving birth to society. The part, patriarchy uh, has institu uh, institutionalized uh, adultery under the guise uh, of reproduction. Both wife and hand handmaid are required to live together in the house and uh, must collaborate in the sexual ceremony. The handmaids are valued mainly as uh, child breeders because of women's subordinated positions to men. The commanders undergo a, uh, a regular procreational ceremony with both the handmaids and the wives. The wives uh, lie directly under the handmaid 
to feel that she is the impregnated vessel. With this way, the scene shows us the sanctity of marriage. In The Handmaid's Tale, nearly everyone's identity has been stolen, everyone uh, has been renamed and repositioned. The handmaids are all uh, referred to by names that signify the uh, commanders they serve, such as of Red, of Warren, of Charles, etc. These names are patronymic, uh, composed of the possessive uh, preposition and the first name of the gentleman. The fact that the handmaids are assigned new names, uh, such as of Red or uh, of Warren, suggests uh, how the Western practice of assigning women the man's last name upon marriage defines a woman in terms of their man. Also, women aren't supposed to use their minds in the system of that world. They are forbidden from reading, reading, working outside the home, or even spending money. The small minority who are fertile are forced to become the eroticized baby-making machines. Their bodies are hidden and their brains are denied. The body and its fu functions uh, have become more important than personality, education uh, or mind. Therefore, no character is represented by his or her real name. Women are divided into social c categories, uh, each one signified by, by a uh, specific colored dress in a, a similar style. Handmaids wear red, Martha's green, and wives blue. Um, the dress code means that the women uh, are no longer individuals. They have become interchangeable like identity. In Western society, clothing is uh, taught as a means of expressing our uh, individuality or personal style. What people wear uh, helps reveal who they are. The narrator grew up with this notion, but it was taken away from her when he, she became a handmaid. <coughs> On the other hand, in uh, Gilead, the opposite is true. Everyone dresses alike within their social uh, group. Clothing reveals studies uh, while uh, masking individuality, which discouraged, which is discouraged. The clothing uh, restrictions in Julia take uniforms to a whole uh, new level of uh, wrongness pointing to the complete abs absence of choice. The clothing the handmaids, the clothing the handmaids wear is supposed to make them all the same uh, to other people and to to each other. Their clothes both blind them uh, to the outside outside world and keep them uh, hidden from it. The narrator rejects her clothes even though she has to wear them by saying uh, red is not her color. Red, of course, is the uh, color of blood. The film is paralleled with the thoughts of Kate Millett about the power structured relationships in which one group of uh, people are controlled by another. Ed Wood demonstrates the negative effects of patriarchy when she shows how in a patriarchal society women cannot be independent because they are taught they must depend on men in, or in order to survive. <coughs> this is demonstrated in the film Ben Offred describes her living situation. Quote, uh, household, that is what we are. The commander is the head of the household. The house is what he holds. To have and to hold till death do us part. Unquote. In the West, uh, it is normal for a man to be at the head of the household. However, this, is, uh, this idea subordinates women. The word hold uh, connotes uh, uh, an or, uh, ownership 
of uh, or to own a house implies that the owner possesses and controls the contents of the house. In this case, uh, men own or possess their homes and families, especially uh, women. The tale is accorded with uh, Mary Almond's thoughts of genocriticism, as the tale is narrated by the female character of Red. Also, we learn uh, the tale from of Red herself, so it's true to uh, Susan Kaplan Cornelian, as art should reflect uh, life so that experiences can show us reality. The Handmaid's Tale comprises of Red's record of life within uh, Gilead. As she uh, performs her duties under the strict system of female control, uh, she struggles with her uh, multiple, multiple lose, uh, losses. The tale explores the effects of the Gilead system, a first-person point of view that uh, gets our sympathy. Offred's uh, tale functions as a critic of women's uh, oppression. In the film, uh, as we can see from one of her, one of her, uh, her earlier statements problematizing biological determinism. Quote, uh, I avoid looking down at my, mo at my body, not so much because uh, it, is a shame, it is shameful or immodest, but because I don't want to see it. I don't want to look at some, something that torments uh, me so completely. Unquote. Ofrit's narrative is so important for several reasons. For one thing, it is, it is an act of defiance by, uh, by telling her story. Ofrit refuses to forget the past or the present. In a society in which uh, women are forbidden to read or write or to speak freely, her tale becomes a protest. In fact, uh, it becomes her gesture of resistance to imprisonment in silence. Just as it, uh, it becomes the primary means for her psychological survival. As Ofred tells her story, she incorp incorporates the stories of other women into her narrative. Her voice multiplies to become the voice of women rather than the voice of a single narrator. Thus, The Handmaid's Tale isn't just of, uh, of Red's protest against uh, her oppressive condition, but the collective protest, protest of every woman. Women are strictly controlled so that uh, my, uh, male dominance, which had been threatened in prejudice, Pregiliat society can be reasserted. The success of the patriarchy depends on female self-regulation, and the women of Gilead are trained to place their uh, loyalty to, to men before their loyalty to women. Gilead uh, relied on the domestic hierarchy for its success. Thus, the Handmaid's Tale il, uh, illustrates the. Lack of female solidarity. Edward uses female characters from different classes with the emphasis of a uh, new form of misogyny. The wives uh, are enemies rather than companions. Their blue goes uh, belie, their, belie their position as rivals. Uh, to the infertile wife, uh, the handmaid would seem a competitor for her uh, husband's affection and sexual desire, and ultimately for the highly prized role of the mother. In a scene of uh, the film, Alfred tells us, uh, quote, she doesn't speak to me unless uh, she can't avoid it. I am a reproach to her and a necessity, unquote. In a society that prizes children so highly, the handmaid's role is to uh, be read as surrogate mother. Women of uh, lower social rank are also enemies. Econo wives um, resent the handmaid's privileges and high social status. With these examples of misogyny, the aims of this paper is to show that 
Without solidarity, without sisterhood, women are not united. If women are disunited, hopelessly they will not be able to break uh, their image of the uh, two legged worms on patriarchy, except for the ways of prostitution, exile, or death. Then they become parts of the oppressive social order that they do not wish to include. Edward warns us about the cunning domination of women by men and the fact that the hidden power of our unconscious leads each other and ourselves. Thank you. I would like to thank all of the three speakers one more time. And unfortunately, I need to close the session now before taking your questions and because uh, the certificates will be presented to our speakers. And I think you can ask your questions later on individually. Thank you. Scholars, thanks for your brilliant papers. It has been huge brain work uh, for you to get prepared for this conference, but for us as co uh, organizers as well. So you did marvelous job as the attendants. As for us, we do not claim that we did flawless job. Uh, please forgive our errors, shortcomings, unintentional mistakes. We'd like to hear your feedback, uh, suggestions, and amending notes later. So new items are added to our reading list, thanks to your papers. Uh, I hope you find answers to your inquiries, but have further questions in mind for future studies. So I'm glad to see that um, young scholars are ready for the market. And I'd like to say farewell till next time, and uh, would like to present your certificates here. Uh, um, so, shall I call your names? Then you come up here to the stage. Oskan, it's you first. Pınar Çelik, if she's here. Thanks, Pumar. Well, could you wait a bit? Okay. But before, please take this. Right. Please sign this. Get your envelope and take back to. I mean, bring back the paper to me. You can do it here. Right. Salda Sarac. Serap Çiçek. Sinem Maden. minutes. I'll find yours. Thank 
congratulations, Ildos. Could you sign this and get the envelope here, please? Yudum, Allah. Zeynet Öztunca. Zeynet. Thanks. Well done. Could you wait a minute, please? I'll give you. Sign the slip, please, and then I'll get it. Ayşe Tuğba Uğraş. Could you wait a minute, please? Sure. Here you are. Sign the slip. I'll get it. Nurul Hude Baykal. Nihan Simge Soyuz. Murat Arslan, please. Tokel. Merve Çelik Sümer. He's absent. I didn't see him. Mehtap Hayırsöz. Mehtap, you're from which university? Gaziantep. Okay, could you wait, please? Akbaş. Gözde. 
I think we, we made a mistake there, so we can change it soon. I'm sorry, but please, this is correct. Um, sign it. It's here. Right. Okay. Take this anyway. I'll sign to you another soon. Quite soon. You'll sign here. Thanks. Then Gökçe gün doğdu. Duygu deliler. Dilek Tuna Dursun. Oh, they took it. Who took our pen? It's here. Okay. Janan Eygün. The slip back to me. Betül Taş Yapan. Betül Kat. I think Ekrem left early. And that's key. That's all. Thanks again for coming. Oli. <laughs> Teşekkür ederim. Kendiniz için çok teşekkür ederim. Ben çok mutluyum ki tanıdığım için. İsim? Şuraya koymuşsun sanırım Betül. <gülüyor> o değil, ben değil, sen almamışsın. <gülüyor>